In late November 1998, Chicago police cordoned off a section of the city's northwest side. Reporters and onlookers gathered on the chance that there might be a gruesome discovery. Police had received a tip that the yard behind this picket fence had been used as a burial ground 20 years earlier by John Wayne Gacy. Investigators dug it up and found nothing at all. And yet the attention lavished on this one bad lead was a fitting postscript to the life of a man who fooled the world while he killed at least 33 people. Gacy, I'm sure, from wherever he is right now, was laughing hilariously at the people digging, or he's laughing today that they didn't dig in the right place to find something that he's left. In the Chicago winter of 1942, John and Marion Gacy awaited the birth of their second child. The young couple already had a daughter, but John longed for a son to carry on the family name. On March 17th, he got his wish, when Marion gave birth to a boy. They named him John Wayne, after Marion's favorite movie star. The Gacy children, including a third child, Karen, born two years later, grew up in this modest bungalow in a blue-collar neighborhood. Their father, the son of Polish immigrants and a World War I veteran, worked as a machinist building control panels for utility companies. He was the breadwinner, so that's what I think he thought his respective duties were to bring home and provide for us a home and food, and, but he wasn't the nurturer. Gacy Sr. was an uncompromising man who demanded obedience from his children, especially his only son. He expected Johnny to be like the other boys who played stickball, climbed trees, and fished. The father was an avid fisherman and tried to teach his son the sport, but the boy had no interest. Instead, Johnny would much rather cook with his sisters or garden with his mother. When he wanted to work on flower beds that he put in around the house, it was like, you know, the sissy thing to do. And Dad was very vocal about that. John wanted his father to know, Dad, I love you. I am your son. But please, let me be Johnny Gacy. The father would often ridicule Johnny in front of his sisters and other children in the neighborhood. It's just a constant stream of, you wimp. You know, you're not going to be anything. You can't do this. What are you, one of the girls? Taunts from a father toward a son can be devastating. While Johnny's father was rigid and emotionally distant, the boy developed a special bond with his mother. Mom was a uh, confidant. You could go with, to mom and tell her a lot of things uh, that you couldn't talk to dad about. And I think my dad felt threatened by that, felt, felt like they were keeping secrets from him. Marion was a homemaker, but her husband acted as if he ran the household. The couple argued frequently about everything, from chores to child rearing. She tried so hard to keep the family together, knowing that her husband drank, and when he drank, he went into rages, and he usually uh, turned on John. After his shift on the assembly line, Johnny's father would escape to the basement where he would drink brandy before supper. Marion and the children would wait at the dinner table in fear and silence until he climbed the stairs drunk. If the children misbehaved, he would spank them with a razor strap. We actually learned how to toughen up against it. And John especially, he would not cry. He would not cry, and sometimes I think that made Dad angry. Johnny not only felt alienated at home, he longed to be accepted by his classmates, but a congenital heart condition prevented him from playing with the other kids. I was wrestling around with some older kids, and I passed out, and I remained unconscious for about 10 or 15 minutes. We went to the doctor, and they said I had an enlarged bottleneck heart, so I was more or less like a sickly kid. Gacy's father expressed no sympathy for his son and saw the heart condition as one more failure. He pressured the boy to do well in school. 
Johnny disappointed his father even more when he fell behind in his studies because he was at home sick so often. In 1954, when he was 12, Johnny made his first real attempt at fitting in with the other boys when he joined the Boy Scouts. He earned merit badges in wilderness survival and campfire cooking. But despite his sense of belonging and achievement, Johnny knew he was different from the rest of the troop. The only other person who recognized this was his best friend, Barry Buscelli. One afternoon, while playing in his bedroom, Johnny shared a secret with his friend. Johnny had his mother's silk panties and bra sitting in a bag in this closet. I was astounded. I said, Johnny, what are you doing with those things? And um, he said to me, he said, I wonder if I ever dressed up as a woman, how I would look. Young Gacy was deeply confused about his sexuality, but there was no one to help him, so he buried his secret deep inside. By the time he entered high school, the young man had learned to hide his confusion. John dated several girls and attended school dances with them. But neither his grades nor his health improved. In 1960, while attending Prosser Vocational High School, John was learning the printing trade. He had several fainting spells in shop class. His teachers agreed that he would never be able to work with machinery. John dropped out. He had disappointed his father yet again. I couldn't get along with my father. I mean, he was just overbearing. I was dumb and stupid, never would amount to anything, and so I just took off and this is the hell with it. In 1964, when John was 22, he accepted a job as a shoe salesman in Springfield, Illinois, the state capital, about 200 miles south of Chicago. On his own and free from his father's resentment, John was determined to make a name for himself. His mother, Marion, and sister, Karen, both thought a little independence was exactly what he needed. That was John's... Um hate to say the word salvation, but I think that that's where he came alive. He became himself. Gacy craved acceptance and found it through volunteer work with the Junior Chamber of Commerce, better known as the JCs. Working harder than he ever did in school, Gacy organized anti-litter campaigns and booked speakers for sex education classes in the public schools. Soon, John found himself hobnobbing with politicians including on several occasions, Illinois Governor Otto Kerner. He was always very eager to volunteer to do anything at all. Uh, whatever came up, he was eager to do. But he also, at the same time, wanted to make sure that he got uh, his name in the paper or uh, some recognition of some kind. In February 1964, Gacy began dating a shy bookkeeper who worked with him at the shoe store named Marlene Myers. Marlin's family was better off than his own, and John saw the relationship as another avenue for him to get ahead. That September, the couple married. The following year, his new wife became pregnant. They were real excited about the baby coming, and uh, John was just really, I mean, he just gleamed uh, the real proud father thing. You know, he just, he just glowed. John was thrilled with the prospect of becoming a father, but the yearnings he had repressed as a boy were forcing their way back to the surface. On February 24, 1966, while Marlin was in labor in the hospital, John was at a bar with a male co-worker. We went to his house, and uh, instead of having coffee, we had a couple more drinks, and I must have passed out. I woke up, laying on his bed, with no clothes on. Gacy had oral sex with the man, and the next morning felt both exhilarated and ashamed. He pretended nothing had happened. He rushed to the hospital to see his wife and his newborn son, Michael. He was such a good father uh, when Michael was born. He was very nurturing, and he'd kiss them and he'd hold them, and he didn't learn that, I know. So, it was just like a natural thing to him. 
John's parents came down from Chicago to meet their grandson. For the first time, John saw pride in his father's eyes. He was happy when he saw my brother settle down and get married and have a family. He was happy. He, it was like John reached the ultimate with that, that it was okay. He got through all of that, and now he's a family man. Gacy seemed to have everything he wanted, a family, a good job, and a new relationship with his father. But over the next two years, the real John Wayne Gacy would be revealed. By the mid-1960s, John Wayne Gacy had made a name for himself as a young civic leader in Springfield, Illinois, and by all accounts, had a promising future. But the ambitious family man was hiding a sexual compulsion that threatened to ruin him. In 1966, John, his wife Marlene, and their infant son moved to Waterloo, Iowa, a small town about 100 miles north of Des Moines. John's father-in-law owned three Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants in Waterloo. Business was booming, and he needed a manager. So, at 24, his son-in-law began learning the restaurant business. John loved being the boss and insisted that his employees and friends call him Colonel. He wanted to be able to control people. He loved the idea that he could um, tell people, this is what I want you to do. I'm the boss. John put in 16-hour days, but his commitment to the JCs never faltered. He was soon considered the most valuable new member in the Waterloo chapter. I think probably it's just John's personality. Uh, he was very ambitious and wanted to be loved by everybody and liked by everybody and accepted, and it, it was just his way. Local JC president Charles Hill was impressed with John's charm and powers of persuasion. The JCs appointed him chairman of their membership drive. And talk about a membership chairman that no holds barred. I mean, he just did everything he could do to get new members, and, and he did it. He did the job. Gacy lured men into joining the JCs by inviting them to the Clayton House Motel, where he screened illegal stag films and hosted orgies with prostitutes. In one evening, he signed up 20 new members. John's sexual romps also carried over into his marriage with the full participation of his wife, Marlene. After an evening out, they would often swap spouses with other couples. When John's sister, Karen, came in from Chicago for a visit, her brother and sister-in-law revealed their little bedroom secrets. He said, sometimes we don't always go home with the same persons we came with. I really thought it was a joke, but when it came time to go home, he took somebody else home to their house. That was the first time I felt I didn't know my brother, I, that I didn't know him. And I definitely, you can imagine how my um, thoughts diminished about this sister-in-law. The Waterloo JCs knew all about John's sexual escapades, but that didn't keep him from earning enough votes to win the JC vice presidency and being honored as their Man of the Year. By 1967, he was a shoe-in for J.C. President and the father of another child named Christine. Yet there was a side to Gacy that his family and cronies had never seen, an insatiable lust for teenage boys. One afternoon, while Marlene and the kids were away, John invited over 15-year-old Donald Voorhees, whose father was a J.C. and an Iowa state senator. Gacy asked the teenager if he had ever watched a stag film. When he said no, John set up the projector in his basement. He got Donald drunk to lower his inhibitions, then forced himself on the boy. Young Voorhees engaged in oral sex with Gacy. Afterwards, John hinted that he had mob connections back in Chicago. He threatened the teenager and paid him $50 for his silence. The kid, over the next period of time, uh, 
just was beside himself, couldn't uh, do anything, did not go to the police right away, um, felt, as Casey had said, that in fact nobody would believe him. In March 1968, the teenager finally broke down and revealed everything to his family. His parents pressed charges against Gacy, who was arrested and charged with sodomy. Well, Gacy took the charges out there terribly. He was at first very, very um, vigilant in his protection of himself and his family. He was one of these, it was one-on-one, -on -one. it wasn't me who did this, I wouldn't have done it, the kid's a liar. Gacy was convinced he could outsmart his accusers and insisted he be given a lie detector test. He failed. Investigators even joked that the only truthful answer came when he was asked his name. He felt that his world had crumbled. People would see him coming, they didn't want to be around him. And I think it drastically affected his personality. During the investigation, other teenage boys came forward with allegations of sexual abuse. Gacy pleaded guilty to the sodomy charge, but insisted that 15-year-old Voorhees willingly engaged in oral sex with him. This young individual made the charge at me. He claims that he was sexually abused by me. And in essence, he was blackmailing me for it. Now, what it boiled down to was oral copulation. And it was uh, consensual. The judge didn't see it that way and gave Gacy the maximum sentence, 10 years at the state penitentiary in Anamosa. He would never see his wife, Marlene, or his children again. Gacy arrived at the prison in December 1968. It's like he accepted it, like I did the crime so I get the time. And I mean, he didn't say anything, but just he didn't break down. Again, he didn't cry. He did not cry. We all cried, including my father. Even behind bars, Gacy aggressively pursued all of the social outlets available to him. He not only made friends with fellow prisoners, but he mingled with the guards, social workers, and even the warden. Within eight months, Gacy landed a job as head cook in the prison kitchen. He loved trying out new recipes for the inmates. I can say unreservedly that the quality of the food improved dramatically. One thing John was, was a very, very, very fine cook. And he understood something that traditionally folks who cook in prisons don't understand. He understood the use of spices. In December 1969, a TV film crew visited the prison to shoot a segment called Christmas at Anamosa. In this rare footage, the head cook spoke with pride about the meal he was preparing for his fellow inmates. The men, with the exception of the, the turkey, which they get a generous proportion of, and the pumpkin pie that will be served, are allowed to take as much as they want to eat. The only requirement is that you eat what you take. After his interview, Gacy joined the prison choir in singing a carol. But this holiday season would be John's worst. Back in Chicago, his father was battling cirrhosis of the liver. On Christmas morning, John Stanley Gacy died. The news devastated his son. He was convinced that his father died of shame over his sodomy conviction. He felt like he s stripped him of any dignity. He was remorseful about that, uh, that he disappointed him in such a way that it killed him. And a lot of times we'd sit and we'd talk, and I'd say, John, you didn't. It was a disease. Dad's drinking is what created his death. Gacy's grief quickly turned to rage, which he took out on inmates he suspected were gay. One afternoon while walking back to his cell, he spotted two prisoners having oral sex. Gacy kicked one of the men in the face, then returned to his cell. There was someone who was struggling with an inner demon that did not have to do with hating homosexuals, but with being attracted to them. And John hated prison every day that he was there. After his father's death, a lot of hate, including that one, became much more powerful in his personality. 
On June 18, 1970, prison officials released him on good behavior. He had served 16 months of his 10-year sentence. John returned to his hometown, Chicago, alone, and let his family there know that he was determined to start a new life. Gacy moved in with his recently widowed mother and got a job as a short order cook. John worked hard and stashed away every penny he made. It's like he couldn't rest. Something definitely was driving him. And uh, his temperament was different. It's almost as if he had a little plan of action. He was going to be successful. By June 1971, Gacy had saved enough money to start his own contracting company. He called it PDM for painting, decorating, and maintenance. The following year, John and his mother bought this ranch house in Norwood Park on the outskirts of Chicago. By now, he had a steady girlfriend named Carol Hoff, who was recently divorced and on welfare. Gacy had known her since high school. John confided in Carol about his bisexuality and his prison record. She was naturally concerned, but tolerant. She saw her boyfriend as a hardworking, caring man her children loved. From the beginning of their courtship, her two daughters, Tammy and April, called him daddy. He loved the girls and they loved him. There's no doubt about that. But his and Carol's relationship was that of a, a friendship as well as their love for one another. Yet Carol's affection was not enough for Gacy. He could no longer control his hidden attraction to teenage boys. Something deep inside of him was about to snap. On January 2nd, 1972, Gacy picked up 16-year-old Tim McCoy at the Greyhound bus station. John offered to show the boy the sights, then lured him back to his house, where they engaged in sex. When they were done, Gacy grabbed a kitchen knife and plunged it into the teenager's chest. Then he buried the body in the crawl space under his house. It was impulsive. He really hadn't planned on killing him. But I think that once he did make that move, it gave him the ultimate power trip. Gacy was able to act as if nothing had happened. Seven months later, he and Carol were married. She and her daughters moved in with John. His mother moved out to give the newlyweds privacy. Soon after the wedding, John's relationship with his wife began to deteriorate. He still longed for sex with young men, wherever and whenever he could find it. On the night of July 31st, 1975, Gacy had the house to himself and invited over one of his young employees. 16-year-old John Butkovich had worked for Gacy for nearly a year. First, on the pretext of doing a magic trick, he coaxed the boy into slipping on a pair of handcuffs. And he says, what's the trick to this? I can't get these things off. And at that time, Gacy went in his pocket and grabbed the key to the handcuffs and says, the trick is you have to have the key. Then, with his victim gagged by his own underwear, the sexual torture began. Afterwards, Gacy looped a rope around the teenager's neck, then slid a stick between the knots. It's in a tourniquet, so it cut off the air. So if you're gonna kill somebody, you, you just put it on their neck and twist it three times or four times or whatever till the person stopped moving. He removed the handcuffs and disposed of the body. Now, Gacy had killed twice. His psychiatrists would come to believe that the motive could be traced to his abusive childhood. There began to be a confusion between feeling uh, better about himself in the sense of empowering himself to overcome this childhood sense of failure and his sexual desires and needs. He liked handcuffs. He liked to hurt people. But he did it more in the sense of wanting to experiment to see how somebody would react. Gacy's double life had taken shape. Family, friends, and business associates had no idea who the real John Wayne Gacy was. Not only was he a prosperous entrepreneur by day, but even entertained children in hospitals. 
he would dress up as a clown he called Pogo. When I got into clown makeup, I regressed into childhood. It was fun being a clown because you could, you, you could be yourself or, or just let yourself go and act a fool. Gacy even dabbled in Cook County politics and was named a Democratic precinct captain. He would help people. He would do favors for people. The old-fashioned precinct captain, if they needed something, a garbage can or something, he'd get it, a Christmas tree, he'd get it for them. If they needed uh, construction work, he would do it and have somebody do it for them. Everybody knew John Gacy, and he knew everybody in his precinct. But Gacy's hectic schedule was taking its toll on his marriage. He had stopped having sex with his wife, Carol, and they bickered constantly. One afternoon in 1975, John berated Carol for spending too much money. After three years of marriage with him, she filed for divorce and soon left the house with her daughters. Now single again, the 33-year-old Gacy was like a wild beast uncaged. With no wife and children to look after, he resumed his hunt for young men. Gacy would abduct teenage boys, sometimes at gunpoint, and drive them back to his suburban house, where he would rape and kill them. But he was growing tired of digging holes in his crawl space. He wanted graves readily available. Gacy hired an unsuspecting employee, David Cram, to trench for piping and instructed him to break ground only in the areas he had marked. He would lay out the trench. All right, this is where you dig, this is where you dig. Don't vary from the path. And there was also comments about the time factor. Well, you come down, see how I was doing. How's it going? Are we done yet? You done being down there? Cram also rented the spare bedroom in his boss's house. He returned home one night and found Gacy drunk and dressed in his clown costume. Gacy invited Cram to join him for a drink. The men had a few Mai Tais, then Gacy tricked Cram into the handcuffs. And he's laughing, ha ha ha, you know, um, just like a little kid. You know, and, and again, I'm standing there looking at a clown in a clown suit, laughing at me because I'm locked up. And he's like, poke me. Does it bother you, huh? Does that bother you, huh? So I told him, I said, if you don't take these off, I'm going to kick your ass. The teenager then saw a side of his boss that few ever lived to tell about. It was just like a light switch went off in the middle of a conversation, in the middle of a sentence, in the middle of a thought. He just starts growling like a mad dog. Gacy lunged at Cram and swung him around the room, shouting, I'm going to rape you. Despite the handcuffs, Cram was able to push Gacy to the ground. He somehow managed to grab the key and escape to his room. David Cram moved out. Others were not so lucky. By the end of 1977, Gacy had killed 19 young men in his home, all the while carefully maintaining his double life. In May 1978, he was back in the limelight, organizing the Polish Independence Day Parade in Chicago. The guest of honor was none other than First Lady Rosalind Carter. At a function that evening, the serial killer mingled just inches from the president's wife. By December, Gacy was committing a murder every two or three weeks. He showed no signs of stopping until an investigation into a missing youth would lead police to Gacy's front door. By 1978, 36-year-old John Wayne Gacy had sexually tortured and killed 32 young men. He had not only managed to cover up his crimes, but to keep up his status as a businessman and community leader in Chicago. On December 11th, Gacy met with a client of his contracting company at the Nissan Pharmacy in suburban Des Plaines. Gacy was bidding on a remodeling job. Around closing time, he abducted 15-year-old Rob Peast, who worked at the drugstore. Gacy had lured him into the car with the promise of a better paying job with his company. The teenager was never seen alive again. He became Gacy's 33rd victim. The next day, after witnesses at the pharmacy said Peast was last seen with Gacy, police questioned him about the boy's disappearance. He would say, I was in the drugstore, but I never saw him. You got the wrong guy. It was always, I'll cooperate. 
He had gotten away with so much before that he thought he was so smooth that he'd get away with this one just as easily. This time, Gacy couldn't talk his way out of trouble. Police didn't buy his story and got a warrant to search his house. While they found nothing they could tie to Peast, they did discover numerous personal items belonging to other missing teenagers. Gacy was now a murder suspect, but without the bodies, little could be done. Gacy was placed under 24-hour surveillance. If he was nervous about the police presence, he was putting up a good front. The first night of the stakeout, Gacy picked up the officer's dinner tab. My partner and I had to continuously remind each other that he's a suspect for murder. I mean, he was a very likable guy, and he never really intimidated you. He wasn't the kind of guy that you'd be afraid of, uh, but he was a hustler. Gacy even had the surveillance team over to his house for a fish dinner. When one of the officers smelled a foul odor coming from the air vents, investigators were all but convinced that the crawl space below had become Gacy's makeshift burial ground. We weren't giving up, and he could not lose the evidence. He was sitting on the evidence. And he knew we were seeking a second search warrant. So John was cornered. Gacy realized the truth about his serial killings would soon be exposed. Out of desperation, he met with his attorney for an all-night confession. And then he looked at me and said, I've been the judge, jury, and executioner of many, many people. Now I want to be my own judge, jury, and executioner. I don't want you to interfere. I'm going to tell you everything from the beginning. I kept telling him it was unbelievable, and that's why he offered to show me the crawl space. He was going to prove to me that he committed the murders, and I don't want any part of that. Amarati didn't need to see it, because within hours, investigators were on their way. They had their second search warrant. When they descended into the crawl space, it didn't take long for them to dig up a human bone. On December 21st, 1978, John Wayne Gacy was arrested for murder. At the police station, Gacy seemed to take the news well and even joked with police while they were booking him. When investigators asked where he was born, Gacy looked up and proclaimed that he was, quote, born in a state of confusion. The mugshot captured Gacy laughing at his own wit. Gacy also told police that he was not responsible for his brutal acts because he was suffering from a multiple personality disorder. He knew we were gonna get the rest of the bodies and he knew we had human bones and he knew we weren't gonna stop. So now as he's back telling, he's saying, all right, I'm nuts. Gacy's home in suburban Chicago was besieged by a fleet of officers and evidence technicians. Captured on this rare police video, the excavation of the crawl space was carried out with the precision of an archeological dig. Piece by piece, officers lifted the remains of Gacy's victims through the floorboards and carried them out the front door. It was then that John Wayne Gacy was introduced to the world as the worst serial killer in American history. Yet Gacy seemed more concerned with the police rummaging through his home than with his criminal notoriety. He wanted to make sure his bar that had like 20 some cases of uh, old Milwaukee uh, sitting around it, that he made sure that, that, that nothing was done there and that we didn't dirty his floors. Those who thought they knew him best, his own family, realized they had no idea who John Gacy was. I went into first a denial stage, and then I went into anger. And I told him how much I just hated everything that he had brought upon us. And I saw in my mother, I saw something die in her. There was never that light again. <laughs> there was never that twinkle in her eye from that day forth. It was like someone put the light out and she got rejected because of her love. And she said to me, I'm a mother. 
I love him. How can I stop loving him? 33 bodies were found in all. Now, John Gacy's fate for committing these hideous crimes would be determined in a Chicago courtroom. In February 1980, 37-year-old John Wayne Gacy went on trial in Chicago for the murders of 33 young men and boys. His case attracted widespread attention as people struggled to understand how anyone could be responsible for so many appalling crimes. Hoping to save Gacy's life, his attorneys entered a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. John did not appear worried about being considered a crazed serial killer. Instead, he was afraid the public might think he was homosexual, a charge he denied. I would uh, definitely not be homosexual. Uh, I have nothing against what they do, and I, I don't deny that uh, I've engaged in sex with males, but that I'm bisexual. Gacy was no textbook criminal. Even the psychiatric experts who testified at his trial were baffled by his complex personality. He fit absolutely nowhere. No known diagnostic categories. Part of it is because we don't know what these serial murderers are. We know what they do, but we don't know what they are. The jury was not interested in figuring out who John Gacy was. On March 13, 1980, Gacy was found guilty and sentenced to death. Afterwards, he consoled his defense team and then asked to speak with his prosecutors. He congratulated them for doing a great job. He said they did what they had to do and he respected what they did and they did a great job and he actually congratulated them on getting the death penalty. The serial killer was sent to death row at the Menard Correctional Center in Southern Illinois. He quickly cashed in on his criminal celebrity by becoming an artist. Gacy's artwork won praise from those who appreciated the macabre image of a killer clown. In 1988, John exploited his notoriety by proclaiming his innocence. He wrote and published a book he titled, A Question of Doubt. In it, he passed himself off as the 34th victim and claimed that all the bodies discovered beneath his home were planted there by his employees. The idea that, that I'm, I'm a homosexual thrill killer, that I strolled down the streets and stalked young boys and, and slaughtered them. Hell, if you could see my schedule, my work schedule, you know damn well that I was never out there. One person who kept on believing Gacy was his mother, Marion. Then after a series of strokes, she lost all memory of her son and his crimes. She died in 1989. Five years later, on May 10th, 1994, Gacy's execution date arrived. He was to die by lethal injection at the Stateville Prison in Joliet, just south of Chicago. His sister Karen was there for the final hours. I was losing a brother. I was losing someone that I loved. Of course, there was great sadness to have to part and say a final goodbye to know that this person's not dying because they're sick. They're dying because someone's going to murder them. Hundreds gathered outside the prison walls to celebrate Gacy's execution. Supporters of the death penalty believed that if anyone should be executed, it was John Gacy. The revelers waited for the countdown. We had all leaned over, and I said, John, have you made your peace with God? And he said, I have. And he sobbed. He said, I love you. That was the very last thing. He said, I love you. And I told him the same thing, that I loved him. And I guess that's when it all came to a head that this was it. At 12.40 a.m., John closed his eyes and took a deep breath before the doctor injected the needle. 18 minutes later, 52-year-old John Wayne Gacy was dead. At 3 a.m., his body was secretly transported to a nearby hospital where Dr. Helen Morrison, a forensic psychiatrist, waited to extract Gacy's brain. 
There are so many questions, basically, that, that come up. Uh, what happened prenatally? What happened in the development? What happened to the brain? Can we start doing some human experimentation? Dr. Morrison thought Gacy's brain might show signs of abnormality that could possibly explain his actions. Yet, after examining it, she found nothing. No biological evidence that shed light on Gacy's severe psychological problem, leaving the world with an enduring mystery. I believe, and continue to believe, that what we don't know about John Gacy is more vast than we will ever imagine in my lifetime or in yours. When he was good, John, he was the best of good and he had a high drive for success. But when he was bad, he was the worst of evil and he had a high drive for destruction. Johnny didn't even know who Johnny was. Johnny was playing a role, like on a stage, various parts. Maybe he would have been what he wanted to be. That governor, that politician, that senator. You know, we talk here of all these things. He had the capability. None of it makes sense for his character, for everything we knew about him. I just can't picture that his sexual appetite got so much out of control. I don't think we ever know the person. I really don't. I don't think there's any way you can ever know what's going on through another person. And it's kind of scary to think that we don't know. I mean, we just really don't know.